So welcome back, welcome back to uh, SIHH Live and our studio, TV studio, where in this session we are going to space. Uh, in just six months, we're going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, one of the most significant events in uh, human history. The 20th of July, 69, Neil Armstrong walked first uh, on the moon surface. He was the commander of the Apollo 11 mission, and uh, he said that sentence that has remained engraved in everybody's mind, that's one small step for a man, but a giant leap for mankind. Uh, RJ, who is uh, our brand for this session, started creating watches themed around the moon already 10 years ago, in 2009, representing the moon surface on dials, using materials from space and more. But then its relationship to space uh, goes even deeper than that, because, of course, it has to do with uh, the science of space exploration and how that can inspire and help and propel research and development and innovation in uh, watchmaking. And we're going to discuss some of that, too, in this session, for which I have two guests. The CEO of RJ, Marco Tedeschi, please join me on stage, and the president of the Association of Space Explorers and a former astronaut, Michael Lopez Alegria. Welcome. Morning. Good morning. Please. Michael. Michael, welcome. Thanks. Pleasure to have you both here. Uh, Mr. Tedeschi, let's start with you. Uh, RJ has created the first moon related watches, as I said, 10 years uh, ago. And now we have a new model out, which is the one we see in uh, the image, uh, also inspired by space. It's called Arrow 6919. Uh, tell us about it. So the Arrow 6919 is a very important project for the brand. Uh, it is the first uh, DNA uh, project within the Arrow collection, which is our new core collection. And it has uh, the material, uh, a material we have created in-house, which is a composite material that includes uh, steel from the Apollo 11 mission. And not only the material is important in this watch, because this is also the first manufacturing movement we have ever created. So this is really uh, the first step into manufacturing uh, movement. <clears throat> and I'm very happy uh, that this project is linked to the space exploration, because this is a true passion for me. So, just to be precise, this is the first in-house complication that RJ has ever, ever created, Absolutely, right? yes. Uh, and when you say we use uh, uh, steel from the Apollo 11 mission, how do you go after getting steel for the Apollo 11 mission? So, actually, this is something very uh, difficult. Uh, the steel is, was bought uh, from several auctions uh, authorized by NASA, because, as you know, it is very uh, difficult to get uh, such material. And uh, we wanted to do a little bit more than only using the material, as we used to do before. And this is why we have created a composite material uh, that really shows something uh, special on the watch. And you can see it on the, on the bezel. Indeed. Uh, how does, we've discussed a lot before this, but how does uh, space exploration and space in general uh, help propel, inspire innovation in watchmaking? Aside from the design, of course, the moon and, 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 and the moon surface on the dial, but uh, what's the link there between space exploration and innovation in watchmaking? I believe in terms of uh, technology, both industries are, are quite similar. The only difference could be maybe a difference of scale. And, uh, of course, space exploration is a great uh, inspiration in terms of design, as you said, but also sometimes in terms of materials, because some of the material we are using, uh, for example, for the strap, uh, are part of the outfit of the, of the astronaut, I, I believe, and Michael can tell us a little bit more about it. There is a, a lot of different layers in the, in the spacesuit, but the, this polyamide we used is one of the material that is used also uh, in space uh, exploration. So, RO 6919, 6919, uh, the 69 is 1969, absolutely. and the 19 is 2019, so it's explicitly a watch for the 50th anniversary of the moon Yes, landing. absolutely, yes. Okay. And uh, we also tried to have uh, some uh, uh, little inspiration within the, the watch design. Uh, for example, the rotor uh, has a shape that reminds the, the five uh, F1 engine of the Saturn V rocket. Mm -hmm. So, we really try to have uh, little details that reminds this uh, incredible uh, mission. And it comes in titanium, ceramic, and gold, as we see in, the, in the image. Each is limited to 100 pieces. 100 pieces each? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
Michael, you were, what, maybe 10 years old when Neil Armstrong walked on, no. on the moon. Uh, what do you remember of that moment? So I was living in uh, California at the time, <clears throat> and my family and I were uh, at the beach. And, um, you know, we were playing in the water, the kids were, and as they, the parents started asking us to get out of the water, and we didn't understand really why, um, so we all sort of gathered around a transistor radio that were playing on the blankets and to listen to the final moments of the descent to the lunar surface. So this seems a little corny, but I honestly remember that it seemed like the waves stopped crashing just at the moments when he said, the eagle has landed. And um, I remember the adults were, you know, hugging each other, complete strangers were, you know, shaking hands and embracing each other. And it was sort of really a, a moment that, that uh, is seared in my memory. Uh would you say that's the moment when you started getting inspired about potentially becoming an astronaut, or that came later? Well, around that time, I was already interested in, um, in NASA. My mother actually worked at an uh, education office at NASA, and she would bring home some brochures, some pamphlets about missions that were going on, but not so much the human missions, because there weren't that many of them at the time. But my friend, my best friend, and I played astronaut in m the closet of my bedroom, which we had the inside mocked up to look like a We will see a picture later. <coughs> we see the astronauts really leaving closets when they're up on, on, on space. Uh, it has always struck me that until the Apollo 8 mission in, in 68 and then the 17, uh, a couple of years later, a few years later, we had literally no idea how our planet looked like. And then uh, they started bringing pictures like this one. Uh, which is called the Blue Marble, and there are many versions of the Blue Marble over uh, a few years, but essentially this changed our understanding of Earth, right? Yeah, I, I think, you know, especially at the time, before we had so many Earth observation satellites that we have today, when you look at Google Maps, for instance, you can get fantastic yeah. images, but, you know, back then, and even today, when we orbit the Earth, which is not the same view as we see here, but it's uh, you know, much closer, yeah you have a completely different sense of what Earth is like. And, you know, the, the fact is you don't see any boundaries between countries. You don't, you don't really perceive anything. It looks tranquil and beautiful, but at the same time, it looks fragile. You can see the thickness of the atmosphere. You know, if the Earth were an apple, the skin of the apple is about how thick the atmosphere is. So it's very thin, and, and that's all that protects us from a very, very harsh environment. So I think we have a much greater awareness about the need to protect the planet mm -hmm. as well. So how does one actually become an astronaut for NASA after seeing brochures brought back by mom? <laughs> well, so for wh what happened for me is uh, I went to school to study at the Naval Academy, became a Navy pilot, and was becoming interested in becoming a test pilot. Um, and I was reading a magazine article, and in the article they discussed a lot of the graduates that get, had gone on to become astronauts. And these were everyone you'd ever heard of, Neil Armstrong, John Glenn, Alan Shepard, I mean, the real pioneers. And I was already on the path to go do that, almost coincidentally, and that's how the dream was sort of reborn again. But it's a, it's a pretty selective process. Um, it, the astronauts today, Maybe 40% come from the military, and others are scientists, engineers, medical doctors, etc. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a, a, a science, technology, engineering, or mathematics uh, degree, and then some work experience, of course. So you've been on um, three space shuttle missions, and then on the International Space Station as, uh, as well, which is this one. Uh, and, and uh, on the ISS, you actually went even out on space for a spacewalk. This is you during that spacewalk. Probably you did more than one. But tell us about the ISS and life uh, on, on board. This is possibly one of the most ambitious scientific tools ever created. So I, I would say it is absolutely the most ambitious uh, international engineering project ever undertaken. No. So it's in orbit today. Uh, the picture that you saw is accurate. It goes around the Earth every 90 minutes. There are generally six people that live on board there from five partner agencies, the Russians, uh, Europeans, Canadians, Japanese, and Americans. So it's always a mixed crew. Um, and we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, 
I wouldn't say we work. We have to live a normal life because this is a, these missions typically last six months. So we get up in the morning, we have breakfast, we have a conference with the various mission control centers. We work until noon, we have an hour for lunch, we work until you know, almost dinner, we have another you, conference. You, you depict it almost as, a, as a, an office life. It, it, it really is sort of Monday through Friday. Uh, half of Saturday we uh, spend cleaning house. It's interesting because there's no dust. Um, the dust floats and goes into filter, so it's just it's a matter of cleaning the filter, so it's relatively easy. And it's very clean up there. Um, and then we have Sunday off, and um, most people spend it trying to connect with their friends and family. Some people read a book, watch a movie. It's, it's not terribly different. There's always okay. something to fix, just like a home, being okay. a homeowner here. Uh, and then going out on space. Yeah, so this is sort of the, for me, the... We've all seen gravity, you know, and so we have this idea of going <laughs> out to space as being a dangerous thing. Yeah, well, it, it is. I mean, there, it's, it's more dangerous than being inside, for yeah. obvious reasons. But it's a magnificent experience because you're a human satellite. I mean, what you see in this picture is providing you air to breathe, uh, communications, temperature control, protection from radiation plus all the tools that we need to do. And we're not out there, you know, like gravity where they were, one guy was at least wasting his time. The other, the woman was working hard. I would like to think that we work pretty hard out there. They're scheduled for about six and a half hours each and uh, very full of tasks to do. So you don't have too much time to take advantage and really look at the, the planet, which is an incredibly unique experience because of the views that we have from inside are magnified because it's just this tiny little partly carbonate layer that, that separates you from the vastness of space. And when you look at the Earth, you just see the whole thing. And when you turn your, your gaze away at night um, without the light pollution, instead of seeing a black sky with dots of white, it's almost white with m more white than dark just from the quantity of galaxies and stars that you can see. So it's, it's unique and magnificent. Now, I have another picture. It's not from the ISS, it's from another mission, but uh, life on space can be cramped. Yeah, yeah this is uh, smaller than the closet that I played exactly. <laughs> in when I was a kid. This is a Soyuz vehicle that we used to get to and from the space station. And, you know, I mean, everything is about weight. It, it costs somewhere between fifty and $100,000 to lift one kilo of mass to orbit. So as a result, you want to make things as small as possible. And uh, this is no exception. So if you're claustrophobic, astronaut's probably not a good profession for you. Now, you mentioned before missions can last months. Uh, many people may be curious about how do you readapt to life on Earth physically, I mean, after weightlessness for months? Well, I didn't mention that during the, our work day, we have to find two and a half hours of exercise every day. And that's because we start losing muscle mass and bone density from the minute we get into zero G because your organism detects that I don't really need this anymore because I don't have to withstand gravity. That's all great when you're in space, but when you come back, it's quite challenging. So anecdotally, they say it's about a day on Earth for every day that you've been in space to really 100% be back to normal. I would say that after my longest mission, which was seven months, um, it took two days to be able to walk normally, re relatively normally, probably two weeks to be able to drive a car, to have the balance and the visual thing, and then to get over the sense of being tired and, and things feeling heavy, you know, probably close to six or seven months. So wow. it's, a, it's a long recovery. Uh, Mr. Tedeschi, last year you and I had a conversation on this stage, and you were literally in the second day into the job. How has your first year as CEO been? Well, the first year was uh, amazing, very uh, rich of experience. Uh, I had the chance to meet a lot of people. We built a new team. We created a manufacturer. Uh, I've traveled all over the world. And uh, that was a very interesting year, very um, uh, full of experience. And uh, now today is really the, the beginning of the new RJ because as you know, we, we rebranded. Exactly, that was another question I want to ask you about. Uh, that was one of the, publicly, one of the big steps, right? You went yeah. from, last year you were here as the CEO of one brand, and now you're here as CEO of the new brand. 
tell us a little bit about the thinking behind rebranding. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically, uh, last year we presented the, the Spider-Man. That was yeah. one of our collaboration watches. Exactly. Collaboration is one of our pillars. The DNA we are talking about today, having material that belongs uh, to the history, is another pillar. But the one that was missing and that we have created uh, last year was uh, the, the pillar of orology mm -hmm. and uh, the being able to create our own movement to manufacture our own product in house. So that was a big challenge. We didn't have much time, but thanks to, to a great team, we successfully uh, achieved this first project of the, the Moonface movement. We even patented it because that was an innovation, and uh, I'm, I'm super happy to present it today. In terms of the brand, going from a full name to, uh, to two initials, RJ, uh, it plays very well into the current moment of, uh, you know, short, catchy names, uh, things that can work easy on social media, etc. Was that part of the, of the thinking or was there another thinking for the rebranding? Yes, of course, and I think this, this is something that became very normal for, for brands. Uh, if you look at the SIH, some of the brands are initials, uh, some others like the big names, uh, like Audemars Piguet, for example, most of the people are calling the brand AP. So this, this is really the trend, I believe, in terms of, uh, of brand names. And what we try to do is to, to modernize uh, this brand. We went to uh, dark colors, goldish colors, to, to very bright white and, and powerful red. So the idea was really to give a much modern image. And uh, luckily, it's really fitting the, the space theme that we are having um, this year for SIHH. Now that you put all this in place, the new brand, the manufacturer, etc., where do you see the, the brand's core strengths today? Where do I see the, what? The, the, the core strengths of the brand. The core strength is exactly the, the three pillars because those three pillars are very unique. We are the only brand that is producing watches with, uh, with material that belongs uh, from the history. And we are also the only brand that is having luxury brand, not only watch brand, that is having uh, a partnership with both Marvel and DC Comics at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, quite <laughs> amazing for a small independent brand like us. And this is why we are really proud uh, of those, uh, those three pillars. So we can expect more Marvel and DC themes watches in the future. For sure. OK. Uh, what kind of trends do you see now in terms of your clients uh, uh, globally? You know, for a small brand like us that is creating something uh, different, we really need to, to innovate always. And uh, one of the most important thing, I believe, is that the storytelling is as much important as the, the product itself. And this is why we, we are collaborating with um, the most iconic uh, superheroes or trying to, to, to help to, to build awareness uh, for space exploration and, and other projects uh, in the DNA field. Uh, Mr. lopez you are the president of the Association of Space Explorers. Tell us what it is and who are the members. I understand all the members need to have been in space. Right. So we, we are a professional association, um, and our goal is to you know, promote the merits of human space exploration, uh, to promote the uh, inspire the next generation of explorers, so to you know, pass this idea along to the, to the kids, and to promote international cooperation. So it started in 1985, in the height of the Cold War, when a group of Russian cosmonauts, American astronauts, and a few French got together in Saunay and uh, formed this thing to be able to exchange ideas when we weren't really talking to each other. Of course, now that notion is, uh, you know, we work very closely with our Russian colleagues every day, so it's a different time. <clears throat> but the association has endured, and we have over 400 members uh, from 38 countries. We have a, a Congress every year in a different city where we celebrate, you know, our, re renew our relationships. We have a technical interchange. And we also have a day where we go to the community and speak to school kids or universities or businesses or whatever the local organizers want to do. And it's uh, the only requirement for membership is to have made one orbit of the Earth. One orbit of the Earth. So, uh, Mr. Tedeschi, the association has worked together with uh, RJ for many years. Tell us about this interaction. Uh, 
I use interaction because it's not a sponsorship. It's a no, it's not different a, kind uh, of collaboration. Yeah, it's not a sponsorship. It's, it's more uh, sharing the, the same passion for space exploration. Yeah. And I'm really proud that, uh, that Michael accepted our invitation to be here with us today. And uh, I'm really happy to be able, at my small scale, uh, to promote space exploration within the, the watch industry. And uh, this is something we want to, to continue together and to be able to maybe sometimes visit other countries and, and try to promote this uh, amazing human uh, experience that is uh, space exploration. So when you say that some of your watches include materials from space, those materials, aside from the metal you bought from, directly from NASA, uh, are actually certified by the association, I understand. It's not a certification. Uh, it's more an acknowledgement. We have a Swiss notary that certifies uh, from where we bought okay. the, the different materials yeah. and uh, how we created the, the, this steel, because this steel was uh, melting different material into one material. And yeah. with this steel, we created the, the composite material. Okay. So I believe, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the Association of Space Explorers is not a certification organism. It's more a partnership to promote the, the okay. space exploration. Understood. Uh, just a, as the new year was starting, we have had a couple of very exciting moments for space exploration. Uh, Michael. Uh, January 1st, NASA spacecraft flies by the farthest object that we have ever seen, uh, uh, a small rocket called uh, MU69, technically, but ultimately, uh, when we want to write a, a newspaper article, uh, four billion miles away. And then three days later, China lands a robotic spacecraft on the dark side of the moon, which has never been uh, visited before. And for a while after the Space Shuttle program was discontinued, we had kind of the impression that space exploration was you know, hitting a bump and uh, there was not much happening. And now in the last few years and in the last few months, there is this world excitement coming, coming back. Is I'm, I'm, I'm it giving, giving it a good reading or? Well, I think, I think that's absolutely right, except if I would modify it a little bit, um, you know, during the time the space shuttle was retired in 2011, and so you're absolutely right that there is a perception that things were moved to the back burner then, but that's definitely not the case. We've had the ISS has been continuously occupied since 2000 with, as I mentioned, these uh, crew members from all over the world. So that research has been going on in ISS. What happens is when you don't see humans launching so often, it becomes you know, less in the, uh, above the fold in the newspaper. And I think these things that you're hearing about, unmanned missions, you know, first to four billion miles away into the dark side, so-called dark, dark side of the moon, are exciting. And, and we are really getting close to having uh, two new commercial uh, rocket providers to be able to provide transportation to the ISS. So today, we have to rely on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft and Soyuz yeah. launch vehicle. Um, next month, we'll have a test of a SpaceX uh, human-rated but unmanned vehicle to be flown again in June with people aboard, and then the, the Boeing um, version will follow shortly thereafter. So I in America, this has definitely been looked forward to because we want to see launches happening from Cape Canaveral again um, rather than from Baikonur, but also the the, all the agencies seem to be shifting their focus a little bit from low Earth orbit to going back to the moon, either cislunar space initially, but eventually back to the surface, which, you know, it's been 50 years or 48 years anyway, and uh, some people say, why don't we go back there? Well, it's, it's really a question of budget and of geopolitics, and I think now we are on a different course to go back there to actually do something rather than just leave flags and footprints. When you hear the head of SpaceX say, we want to be, uh, send people to Mars in 2024, what do you think? That's a little ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, look, Elon Musk is, a, I, I believe, will be remembered in history as you know, sort of a Leonardo da Vinci of his day. He's very um, brilliant um, and, and he has revolutionized the launch market with the evolution development of, of the Falcon 9 rocket. 
Um, and it's his style is to be very brash and to make some bold statements. And I don't think even he believes we'll get to the surface of, the, of Mars with people in 2024. But it's an aspirational goal. And it's what motivates him and his employees. And I'll tell you, it's, um, it's quite a movement in the US. It's very exciting. What's, what's striking me is that we can send uh, a piece of engineering built on Earth 4 billion miles away, and we can receive back data information and pictures. That's kind of extraordinary. Yeah, still. it's, you know, I think the revolution in the information technology is really uh, amazing. Rocket propulsion hasn't changed much in the last 60 years, but this is what's different now. When, when I flew in the space shuttle, the computers that controlled everything had 512 kilobytes of memory. I mean, that's, nobody even knows what a kilobyte is anymore. Yeah. You know, so it's, that's laughable. And today, these uh, satellites that take images of, of the Earth and resolutions down to 30 centimeters per pixel, I mean, it's just phenomenal. So the technology in that, uh, in Moore's law, has really taken off and, and helped space travel in many ways. Okay, so that's basically what's next for space exploration. Mr. Tedeschi, what's next for RJ? So now we are working um, on the manufacturing movement. This is the next very important project, manufacturing automatic movement. And who knows, maybe uh, in a few years we'll be on Mars too. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you both for coming and uh, you. sharing your ideas and thoughts with our audience. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and while we're going to close the live stream uh, in a second, the next session is going to be at 12 p.m. Geneva uh, time, and we're going to explore the history and wonderful timepieces of Christophe uh, Claret. 12 p.m. Geneva time, back here in the studio. Goodbye.